my talk is called Health Insurance. Is it necessary or desirable? I think you've probably guessed since we're here from what Ian said that uh, obviously we have to pay for health, but the system we have now is neither nece necessary nor desirable, I put it to you. So the question then becomes, how do we pay for health? Because that's what the objective of the insurance is. And then the next question is, what model do we want? And I want to raise these questions just so that you have them in your mind as we go through the, the situations we're in and then what we can do about it. So what model do we want? Do we want a market? And the assumption that a market is you pay for what you get and people offer products and you buy them. Or you can have a right in which you can say, this is the standard of health we want. Now we're going to have this standard of health. The next question is, how do we pay for it? So what, what are we doing? We're setting a market which says who pays what and who gets what, or do we set a standard and then try and meet it through whatever means are most appropriate? Next slide. So the next question is what is health? And that may seem a, um, a twee question. Um, it, it's a state of uh, physical and mental well-being. The word health tends to be captured and stolen and paying when someone says what do you mean about the health system they mean how do you pay for the sickness treating system is what they really mean so when they say health they mean sickness really and that's actually quite a mistake because some years ago they asked the u.s surgeon general who's the sort of health person who was given a status so that he could make uh, pronouncements with some um, authority said what is the greatest health advance in your time, and he said, food stamps. And I think that must never be forgotten, because I have a patient who's on very expensive bone density treatment, which she gets every six months as an injection, and I believe the cause of her weak bones is the fact that the insurance companies wouldn't pay her for her workers' comp injury, and she simply couldn't afford to eat. And I think we've always got to remember that, the reality of what we're dealing with. So when we talk about prevention, people think about vaccine, but they should be thinking about food, and they should be thinking about safety. And safety has to be, medicine has to be compared with other modalities. If you look at road safety black spots, if a certain intersection kills three people a year, then obviously the cost of fixing that road saves three lives, and therefore, that's com comparable, what's the cost of saving a life in the health system? The health system has to be compared to other systems, and if you want to do a bit better than that, you do call things called qualities, which are quality adjusted life years. And you compare how many, li how many quality years of life does somebody get for a certain investment? When I worked in intensive care units, if people came out alive, that was a success. That God knows what cost. And they dribble their breakfasts in the nursing home for the next six months till they died anyway. And we have to remember, we, we have to not be silly or sentimental about health. We really have to be somewhat practical. Now, when you say, what is health? Let's just talk about treatment now. Basics means what we used to do. You know, when everything was done in the local hospital and the surgeon did everything, one surgeon did every system, that's kind of basics. Now we have electives, we all replace our joints, we have coronary bypasses, we get pacemakers so we can't die, heart can't stop, and we have weight loss, which is either dietitians, which we are not really willing to pay for, or bariatric surgery, you know, cutting your stomach so you can't eat as much. Facelifts, so they, should they be on healthcare? What about breasts, you know? Some of us feel a bit deprived here. Um, <laughs> Then we need to look at uh, which specialties will be covered. Now, currently, optometry is psych, physio, chiro, dietitians, and podiatry. You get five visits a year of one of those, and dental isn't covered at all. So we have arbitrary systems and arbitrary professions getting covered. Next slide. Um, the question is, who's in control of this muddle? Um, now, John Menager did a study some years ago, and he said the problem with the health system is there are three groups that think they're in charge. Government, administrators, and doctors. Uh, each one of them isn't quite in charge because each one of them affects the others very greatly. And the fact that three of them are in charge going in three different directions is a big problem. 
I'd like to add private insurance because they think they're in charge. They've got the dollars and basically they're going to tell you what to do. I'm going to expand on that later if we have time. My opinion is there's absolutely nobody in charge and that's the problem. Everyone's chasing the dollars rather than the, than the results. Whoops. Everyone in, in a market model is either trying to maximise their cost, maximise their, uh, minimise their costs or maximise their profits. The health is kind of a byproduct of the market game, shall we say. Next slide. Just who pays for health? And this is actually a direct steal from Ian's slide that he, the, the beautiful circular slide that he had that he said would take two hours to explain. Well, I spent about an hour on it. And when you add it all up, the federal government pays for 43%. The private sector pays for 32%, of which only 12%, in fact, Ian tells me, is from private insurers. The other 20% is paid by individuals out of their own pockets. And state governments pay 25%. The state governments basically run the hospital sector. And so the main object of the state government is to, to take the costs out of the hospital and dump them on the community, which is paid for by the federal government or the individuals. And the basic object of the federal government, as it kills Medicare, is to put people back into the casualty departments and emergency departments, which are paid for by the state. Get it? It's all about you paying instead of me paying. Um, now, next slide. The political players, and I had a go at this, and you can argue if you will, I put them in order of political power, and someone who knows more might argue about this. The governments are still the most powerful and really ought to exert that power a bit better than they do, and federal is more important than state, obviously, from economic reasons. The pharmaceutical industry is extremely powerful um, and has, is taking an ever-increasing part of the budget, and I would argue with ever-decreasing cost of effectiveness per dollar. But they've managed to get themselves a seat on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Board so they can advise, be in there and advise which drugs should be subsidised, which is a huge power thing and allowing them to expand the money spent. The private health insurers are extremely um, influential in the sense that they are seen as crucial, they are setting the prices and they are only paying for 12% of the whole thing. So in fact, they're making huge profits by stuffing it up in my group. The specialist doctors are extremely important in the sense that they are able to set their own prices and they do, and I hate to say it, they are ripping people off, some of them, severely. The equipment manufacturers are very important in the sense that uh, pacemakers, uh, hip and knee replacements are very significant and instead of them, some, the government saying, right, here's a tender for knees, put it in, we'll take the cheapest one and it'll have the same, and controlling the prices as they theoretically do with pharmaceuticals, they lobby each individual doctor and pay top dollar for each different type of uh, hip, hip and knee and the poor old patient coughs up. The doctor lobbies have some effect, this, the AMA and the specialist colleges. The specialist colleges, of course, are very important in keeping a cartel which allows the neurosurgeons or whoever it is to therefore charge uh, more or less what they like. The private hospitals are lobbying, but they're not quite as powerful. And of course, the G GPs and patients have practically no power at all, even though they could potentially save a fortune and do a lot better. Now, there's some assumptions. I've gone to some assumptions. Next slide, thanks. Um, these, just, these are just sort of inherent. They're not ever stated. Um, I wouldn't even say they're correct. But, but health is now a market. Um, and health is a commodity that is bought and sold. So in fact, the idea is if you can get people into your hospital, you make X dollars per operation. So it's, it's, it's bought and sold, and of course if you want an operation, you have to buy it as if you were buying a new boat or some other commodity. Now, some people think health is a right, and I'm inclined to think that's so, but if you actually see what happens in practice, that is doing rather badly compared to the two other options of it being a market and a commodity. The other assumption is that it has to be per, uh, health has to be paid for per visit or per operation because individuals work harder if they're paid per item. And this is an assumption of a lot of people and, and, uh, and a lot of neoliberalism because of course if, if everybody's working by pieces, they have to work harder. Well, I've never worked harder than when I worked in the British National Health Service 
And I believe the people working in salaried positions in Australia work extremely hard, and the idea that people won't work except uh, on a piecework basis is a nonsense. Now, everyone talks about the British National Health Service and how inefficient it is. Next slide, thanks. Um, one of the things that there's a very good book about this called The Political Economy of Healthcare by Julian Tudor Hart, 2006. He's looked at the history of the British National Health Service. He said it was a very idealistic beginning. It was run by the people in it. And basically, they didn't keep track of costs at all. They just did the job, and each person responsible for buying bought as cheaply as they could and had to justify how much they spent to their colleagues. And the admin costs were negligible. They're now about 36%. Um, my father tells me when he started a senior surgeon in Wollongong, he started a surgeon in Wollongong, the hospital was run by the CEO and his secretary. And the CEO was a surgeon who had the biggest operating lists as well. When he left, they had 150 cars driving around and the doctor's car park had been taken over by the administration, which he didn't like very much. But the staff themselves were quite capable of running the system and the assumption is that people in the system can never run it, they need to be administrated, is a very adversarial and stupid idea. When I was at, uh, working at Shell Harbour in 2012, they decided that they, they'd watch all the doctors in emergency to make sure they were working hard. So they watched how many cases each person did each shift. And so instead of cooperating with patients, which you used to do, you'd say, I've got to keep my stick. So you then choose the easy ones, and then you're expected to finish them because no one wanted to take over from you because, of course, they can only, each patient can only count once. So everyone was expected to finish their patients before they went home. But if you had a really complicated, difficult one that was going to take hours to sort out, you wouldn't pick that one before the end of the shift. So in fact, they were sitting on the to take up this. So in fact, this rivalry between the, the doctors in the workplace situation immensely adversely affected cooperation and patient service delivery in order to deliver a key performance indicator to some manager who frankly didn't have a clue. Um, now, if we just talk about efficiency, next slide. If you actually read management theory, and God help me, I have, the best way to manage something is to have good decisions made at the lowest level, so it doesn't become a big issue, it isn't delayed, and so on. And that, of course, means you have to empower and trust the people at the bottom, which Tudor Hart was saying did happen in the British National Health Service before the managerial class came in. So in practical terms, a doctor and nurse can tell you who has the greatest needs? If they've got two problems in front of them, they say, geez, I've only got this amount of time, I've only got this amount of resource, I'd better do this rather than that. So a decision is made to optimise resources at the point of delivery. If, however, this is a private patient and this is a non-paying patient, you have two incentives, which do they then follow? Sadly, a lot of them will go where the money is. In every other aspect of life, that's what we're trained to do. Now, macro decisions need to be evidence-based. So if we say, um, if, if a drug company says this drug is better, then somebody needs to have evidence and needs to say, we will fund this and we won't fund that, right? So that, in a sense, big decisions about where resources are allocated need to be made at a macro level. As I talked about qualities before, how you need to actually measure stuff, and medical needs need to be compared to non-medical needs. Now, if we go to the next slide, talking about the efficiency of insurance, Medicare costs 5%. I've added the 1% to collect the tax. It's about 4%. I might, I think it's 4 point something, Ian, Ian said. Yeah. Ian said 4, I'm saying 5. Okay. Uh, private health insurance as regulated, that's to say um, MBF and those others, are, are, are taking about 17%. But if you take a system like the New South Wales CTP, which would have to be the nastiest, worst insurance system in the world, 48% of its money is either insurer profits or bickering over treatment. So 52%, if you, put, if you pay $100 into your car insurance green slips, which you do every time you register your car, and you get injured, only 52% of that will come back to you, and you might be one of my patients 
sitting in front of the TV in agony with the insurance refusing to pay and the lawyers and various numbers of doctors arguing over it. Next slide. Now, the government is attempted to kill Medicare and they've been attempted to kill it for a long time. If we look at this graph, which comes from the AMA, and I make no apology for that because I believe it's true, you have um, uh, the dates along the bottom, so it's from when it started to now, along the bottom, from what, 1984 um, till now. And then on the up, you have the rise in the CPI is the top line, and the rise in the Medicare rebate to doctors is the lower line. In other words, the Medicare rebate has gone up at less than half the inflation rate. Now, when Medibank was brought in, the doctors were said, look, we won't rip you off, said Bill Hayden. We'll give you 85% of the AMA fee, and you'll get the money, all you have to do is send the chit in to Canberra. It's now sent by computer, but the principle's the same. And, of course, you don't have any bad debts, you don't have to run a secretary, you don't have to do a whole lot of that administration work, you lose 15%, but you get 85%. But the government has been fundamentally dishonest. They haven't raised it against the CPI, so now instead of it being 85%, it's 46%. Wow. So the AMA fee is now $76 for a standard uh, GDP consultation, and the Medicare rebate is $36. And if you're not registered as a GP like me, because you didn't register in the beginning, and you haven't done the RACGP course, you get $21, right? So $21 as opposed to $76. So they're ripping off the GPs big time. And of course, the other thing that needs to be noted on this graph is you can't tell me where the elections were along those lines. You can't, there's no big bumps when Labor came in and did better than the Liberals, right? Both Liberals and Labor have not raised that CPI and have had no commitment to Medicare. So when Labor says they'll save Medicare, they bloody well won't because they bloody well haven't, right? So don't get the idea. When they say they'll save Medicare, do they mean they won't abolish it? It's about all they do mean. They certainly don't want to fix it. Um, I've got to run a thing called Fix Medicare. I, st I own the name at the moment, but I haven't done anything with it. Um, but it'll come. Follow Facebook. Now, look at the current problems. The major universal policy is to shift costs to somebody else. Yep. The federal government keeps the Medicare going down and down. There be, then becomes a gap, so people go to the emergency departments, which are funded by the state. Get it? So it's the federal have pushed this cost back to the state. Now, the state used to run outpatient clinics, so that if you went to emergency, you then went to the outpatient clinic. Now they send you to your, back to your own doctor or your own specialist, and you pay for that. So that's a shift from state to federal to Medicare and also to the patient. So instead of the state paying for the outpatient, it doesn't happen. If you go to the emergency department, they give you two tablets to go on with and a script to fill. So instead of giving you all the tablets, say you're mucking around twice, no, all the extra administrative work is to shift money, the costs from state to federal. So the main policy objective is not, what will the overall thing cost? How can we run this better? The main question is, how can I save my bit of it? And that's obviously very destructive. Then we have public to private insurer. The, the uh, insurance companies won't pay things, so it either goes um, to the, it then it goes to the patient. And the private insurer goes to Medicare. So. And the public simply doesn't offer many services. Many services are simply not offered anymore. So we had the destruction of Medicare is to save government costs and the inefficiency in the private sector is tolerated because the government doesn't really care as long as it doesn't have to pay. The power of the private insurers are basically getting the snout in the trough with all these subsidies, no matter what inefficiency they deliver. And workers' comp and CTP are the worst. Uh, as I say, 48% of the money gets swallowed by uh, profits or bickering about... about uh, about whether they're going to pay or not. There's the power of the pharmaceutical lobby is a big problem, and the politically weak, the GPs and patients, are being totally ignored in this bun fight. I'll just talk about uh, the destruction of Medicare. I have covered it fairly well already. The uh, Medicare rebate has fallen from 85% to 46%, and it's 46% fall just by coincidence. Now, if you say we don't want to pay the doctors too much, well, I don't know how you're going to introduce a national health scheme if you don't pay the doctors reasonably. I mean, hello, they're not going to cooperate. Get, let's get serious here. 
85% was a negotiated deal. The government's been totally dishonest over the last 35 years, and if they don't want to put the money back in, it won't happen. So they've got to simply stop uh, what they're doing. The specialists simply won't work for Medicare. They treat it for bad debts. In other words, if you really have to have an operation, in general, I'll try and get the money out of you. Failing that, if we really have to do it, we, we at least charge Medicare, we get something. That's how they look at it. The GPs have shortened their visits, and what that means is they either bring you back tomorrow and waste your time, or they don't treat cases that they could treat, and they send you off to the specialist, which, of course, generates far, far, far more costs than their visits would ever have done. I mean, a neurosurgeon is uh, somewhere between 270 and $415 for the first visit at the moment, in my experience, and um, compared to the $37 for a GP or even $75 if you paid the AMA visit, it's uh, trifling. Now, some doctors are excluded from, from Medicare, uh, as I say, the Medicare for a GP is uh, $37, for a non-registered GP it's $21. And things like MRI machines are excluded. So an MRI machine, if you buy it, is only allowed to do a certain amount of Medicare and Medicare things. And the MRI machines are interesting in the sense that an MRI machine is very expensive to buy, but the cost of running it is actually virtually nothing. It's a bit of electricity. So in fact, they're charging $700 for an MRI if you're an insurance company, or if you ring around, you can get one for $250, or if you really ring around a lot, you can get one for $150. But in fact, a lot of them are refused because they're too expensive. Well, in fact, the, the cost of them is actually next to nothing. So in fact, the idea you pay per, per uh, use is, is a very bad way of costing something if you want to use the money efficiently. Now, Medicare is also being destroyed because migrants and visa holders are not eligible. Now, they are basically with the 457 visas doing all the dirty jobs nobody else wants to do. And my practice, which has got a lot of ethnic people, have a lot of people injured in car accidents or working for uninsured um, employers in pretty dodgy work practices. And then when they get injured, they don't even have Medicare when the insurance companies don't pay them. I'll just come on to the, the um, next slide, which is the CTP and Workers' Comp, which is an area where I work. Um, the New South Wales government wants to reduce premiums because they can then say to the motorists, hey, your green slips are cheaper, and they can say to the employers, we are user-friendly for business in New South Wales, you have low premiums. So they don't care really what happens to people who are injured as long as they can say the premiums go down. The CIRA, the State Insurance Regulatory Agency, is there to make sure insurers are very tough and don't spend a dollar that they don't have to spend. Silly me, I thought that an insurance regulator might have acted to be fair on the the patients who weren't getting a good deal from the insurance, but that is la la land, that is not what happens. The legislation on CTP and workers' comp was largely written by the insurers, and uh, if I could show you some of their forms, it doesn't ask doctor, can they go back to work, it asks when are they going to go back. The slot that has their diagnosis is a very small slot, so you can only fit one diagnosis in there, so if they've got a whole lost doesn't actually fit in a slot in the form. So you have this sort of mentality of pushing people back to work because that's what it's for, not supporting people who are injured in an open fashion. As I say, there are huge overheads and profits. 48% of the premiums are spent on profit, about, which is about 19% of the gross, and also um, they have huge amounts of bickering. There's four lots of doctors. There's the treating doctor, the doctor who second guesses the treating doctor, the doctor from the plaintiff lawyer, who of course says, backs up the treating doctor, and then the fourth doctor, who is the deciding doctor, called the medical assessment service, and he is used because no one can use the legal system because it's too expensive. So, how long have we got? Three minutes, that's enough. Um, interestingly, I applied for a job just for a lark of the uh, treating doctors, and they want doctors who've written reports for both insurers and plaintiffs. Now, only a very small percentage of doctors have written re reports for insurers. Huh? I'll leave you to guess why that might be. 
So in fact, only the ones that have written. So I thought, well, that, that, that's fair enough, isn't it? The insurers have to mind over the ones being judged. So well, this could set a new precedent when we, did, when we appoint our um, Supreme Court judges, we should ask the people in prison if they think this one's acceptable. Has he, has he been even-handed in all of this, you know, after all? <laughs> it's certainly got a logic to it, you know. But what's happening with this is that they literally dictate to the doctors what you can do. We won't approve this, we won't let you treat that. It's not reasonable and necessary. So they, the, the insurers are on steroids. They are able to withhold. They've got no regulatory agency. This, the state insurance regulator encourages them to, to keep their costs low by not paying, and they do what they like. So we have the new insurer on steroids model telling the doctors what they will and won't pay for, and when they won't pay for it, then the patients simply suffer. They will not get treatment full stop. And if they have to go to a specialist, the Medicare waiting time is over a year. I have had one lady just have a shoulder operation after being on the waiting list for 15 months. The people who write, uh, say, all about how to treat shoulder injuries say, treat it quickly because if the two ends retract, you can't get them back together again properly. Huh? Is that common sense or what? So, the insurers delay, deny and dispute. They use investigators who photograph people. I recently had a very, last week, had a, this week, had a very healthy guy who was on 150K, he's a project manager in construction, he's only 24, he's as fit as a bull there he was before he's injured, he's got a lot of pain from his back. They presented two weeks of investigation of him actually working and said, therefore, there's nothing wrong with him. Why don't they, said to his solicitor, why don't you withdraw the claim? He said, well, I am still working, but I'm in a lot of bloody pain, that's why I come to you. And he's quite a genuine, honest sort of a guy. But that's the mentality we have. We now have rehabilitation people who, of course, visit you at home and say, gee, your house is nice and clean. Oh, yes, did you clean it? Ah, she can work as a cleaner. Ah, and you've got lovely children. Ah, it's a nice photograph of your children. Um, do you take them to school? Yes, she can drive and she can work. <laughs> and so on. And we then have them in, in with the surgery, having a case conference, basically telling the doctor what he's going to do. We have, we've done a functional assessment. Doctor, far better than you can do in this surgery. They're capable of this. You've got to sign this. So we have pushiness and effectively a spy, more or less a spy, in the surgery and in people's lives as they visit the home visit the, and the employer and the doctor's surgery and report it all back to the insurer who's in, in, only interested in costs. And what I would ask you is, is this employer uh, insurer on steroids the template for our health future? Because I think if you think the lack of Medicare is one problem, just look at what the unrestrained power of insurers can be. So what needs to be done, and I'm just about done here, last slide. What needs to be done? Put a single agency in charge, right? You've got, the, as uh, Ian said, the Department of Veterans Affairs is one agency that looks after the lot and saves a lot of mucking about, right? We've got federal, state, everybody else having, the, having their oar in, and of course that is the recipe for a muddle. Fix, the, fix Medicare with a rebate at 85%, and everyone says this is asking for a huge, a huge salary rise for doctors. Well, it is, but in fact, the specialists are charging way above the AMA fee anyway. So we're really only arguing about GPs, which, if you look at Ian's uh, thing, are a very small percentage of the total cost of the health system. Because third point, only Medicare should get government money. We've got to stop subsidising all these Mickey Mouse uh, schemes. I'm talking about health insurance and I'm also talking CTP and uh, other schemes. The only reason they survive is because the assumption is that Medicare will be so slow that it can't do it with private health insurance. In fact, all it does is suck up costs and money. We've got to increase salary component um, so that the sky is not the limit in terms of selling individual services. And non-fee for service components, I mean things like MRIs, that get the MRI first and then use it as much as we can and efficiently as we can. And the ones that, that only charge $150 at Mount Druitt Hospital, you can get an appointment at nine or 10 o'clock at night because they're maximizing their use. That's how they get the costs down. It isn't rocket science, you know. Dental should be in the scheme. This, the, um, that's a historic accident that dental wasn't in Medicare. We need to have cheaper deliveries. I mean, school vaccinations could be done by, the, by a school nurse who went around and vaccinates everybody. Uh, Dental health checks could again be done by school dental nurses, and it is in New Zealand. 
And of course, GP services are immensely cheaper than getting specialists to do things, and there's still a hell of a lot of stuff that GPs could do that they flick past because it's not worth doing. The specialists need to have their, I hate to say it, but specialists, some do badly overcharge, and they have to, have to have some control of that. There would be no pharmaceutical reps on the PBS committees. The, pharma, the, uh, the drugs to be subsidised has to be decided without the input from the pharmaceutical companies. And we have the bulk purchase of prostheses and pacemakers, which of course requires a single contract and a tender to do that. So these are things that can do be done, well, it can all be done at a political level, but people have to understand and have to demand it. And simply things like Labor saying, we'll save Medicare when they've got a track record of doing nothing and a policy of continuing to do nothing has to be called out and uh, challenged. So that's uh, what I think needs to be done with health insurance. Thank you very much for taking questions.